Uh, thank you, and uh, forgive me for, to add my the customary thanks to Irina and uh, Jana for the invitation, but uh, I really enjoy being here. And uh, thanks also to the audience for sticking around till the end of a very long day. Uh, I'll talk, as you can see, about uh, Largo, uh, which is perhaps the most uh, emblematic ensemble of uh, political architecture in Bulgaria and uh, certainly the signature landmark of uh, Stalinist urbanism in the country. Uh, but I'm uh, going to talk about this place as the greatest failure of uh, socialist uh, architecture in Sofia. Uh, even if now, in hindsight, uh, it's seen as representative of uh, the socialist vision of uh, reconfiguring urban space, uh, and also, of course, as an embodiment of uh, the architectural imagery at the time. Yet, uh, in its own time, it was held as such an achievement for a very brief uh, period of time, and unfortunately, that was uh, even before it was uh, completed. Uh, with the end of Stalinism, it became a symbol, a kind of a textbook image even, uh, of everything that was now rejected as ideologically flawed uh, in the Stalinist urban aesthetic, a marble and granite version of the cult of uh, personality. This political turn, of course, uh, affected uh, the aesthetic perception of uh, similar um, uh, urban uh, structures across the Eastern Bloc, from Stalin Alley in East Berlin uh, to the Palace of Culture and Science in Warsaw that we've already heard about. Uh, but this turn will not be at the center of my uh, talk. It's not even at the center of my argument uh, that Lago was the greatest uh, failure of socialist architecture in Sofia. I will discuss um, this failure in the perspective of uh, urban planning and construction, as well as institutional reorganization of technical cadres, uh, in this case the architects and their work process. And in this perspective, from its very conception, Largo was a failure in so far as it complicated greatly uh, the big task of the so-called socialist reconstruction of Sofia and eventually made this task impossible to solve for the next few generations of uh, architects and urbanists. And at the crux of uh, this failure in my mind uh, is um, what I called in uh, the presentation, uh, in the title of my presentation, Non-Synchronicity of Politics and um, Architecture. So let me start with a brief look into the preparation of uh, the Largo project. Uh, the very first step was the post-war master plan of Sofia of uh, 1945, which was elaborated within the frames of a large-scale reconstruction enterprise. With a truly Marxist call, uh, this plan aimed to level uh, the differences between center and periphery, uh, which in the words of uh, the author, Luben Tonev, was, uh, I quote, uh, monotonous and gray, abandoned to sprawl endlessly, lost in mud, misery, and lack of basic uh, living conditions. The approval of this plan in 1945, as I said, uh, was the beginning of a very lengthy cycle of uh, competitions for replanning uh, the city center. Uh, lots of uh, projects were submitted in this cycle, and uh, all of them um, were still under this institutional umbrella of uh, Sofia's uh, post-war reconstruction. Ironically, and at odds uh, with the master plan's uh, light motif, all these competitions uh, focused not on the periphery, but on the center. Moreover, the, the way the center was uh, defined expanded from one competition uh, into another and eventually led uh, to the Largo. At the same time, the main impetus uh, of reconstruction, solving the housing crisis and improving living conditions, uh, was clearly sidelined more and more until it, uh, it was seemingly forgotten. So from this uh, point of view, Largo signaled the failure of the post-war reconstruction of Sofia. Uh, even if this uh, failure was not a um, matter of error, but uh, a deliberate deflection of uh, resources, uh, not only financial, but uh, technical as well, uh, from an acute problem, what was the housing crisis, uh, to a project of uh, political prestige. So, uh, Lago started in 1948 uh, with the construction of the party house. Uh, this is the headquarters, uh, or known officially as the house of the Central Committee of the Bulgarian Communist uh, Party. 
And as I've already mentioned, uh, its construction was preceded by a number of competitions for a detailed plan of the center, and none of these competitions selected a winner. Uh, although the size of the center constantly changed, all competition briefs uh, invariably focused on the area around the former uh, royal palace. Uh, the palace uh, had been destined for demolition by the master plan and had uh, been already gradually encroached upon in a series of uh, symbolic uh, gestures of overhauling the monarchy. Uh, that's how the fence, the guardhouse, and other auxiliary buildings were removed. Uh, yet the palace itself uh, still stood awaiting an agreeable solution for the uh, main city square uh, that had emerged in front of it and also uh, to the side of it, as you can see from uh, those uh, maps. And uh, this uh, square had been renamed uh, 9th of September to honor the Bulgarian uh, Socialist Revolution of 1944. So the plan for this square also demanded a suitable project for an edifice of the Council of Ministers to be erected on the spot of the palace. Uh, yet the replanning of the square faced a lot of technical uh, challenges stemming from the irregular shape, which is uh, very much visible on all these uh, maps, but also the elevation of the terrain, which you cannot see but probably imagine. Uh, so, as the technical work was hindered by the difficult parameters of the task, uh, a new building, uh, which um, had not been part of any competition brief uh, so far, was assigned uh, in a top-down manner, and that was exactly the uh, party house, what would be known as the party house. Uh, with the highest political sanction, the party house was rushed into construction next to 9th uh, of September Square, but uh, with its uh, back to it, as you can see from the uh, top um, uh, map with the superimposition. Uh, and that was done without any regard for the square's ongoing uh, replanning. Uh, more so, the party house own uh, irregular shape and uh, positioning vis-a-vis -vis the square complicated the task of uh, replanning the square even uh, further. And then in 1949, one more complicating factor uh, was uh, added to the planning puzzle, and this was the mausoleum of Georgi Dimitrov, designed overnight and then erected in the course of a week along uh, the opposite side of uh, 9th of September Square facing uh, the palace. Uh, on the photo, you can see the palace uh, behind the trees and then the mausoleum vis-a-vis. Uh, -vis. So all around the palace square, construction went ahead of urban planning, making sure that uh, Bulgarian urbanism would fail uh, time and again to produce a final plan for the city center and thus, ironically, also saving the royal uh, palace from demolition. And you can still uh, see it today as National Ethnographic Museum in the uh, city center. Another year later, in 1950, the government decreed a new plan for the center, which would link the pending 9th of September Square with the future Council of uh, Ministers uh, centerpiece and the area around the party house, which was on, already under construction. This plan exactly invented uh, the Lago as a new assembly uh, with the party house uh, in the middle, uh, which was uh, expected to be flanked by, two, uh, primary, by the two primary industrial ministries of uh, electrification and uh, heavy industry, uh, which were joined by a central department store and uh, a representational hotel. Uh, three more buildings were envisaged uh, that would fail to materialize. Uh, a residential estate for governmental employees, an opera, and uh, the dominant structure, a house of uh, Soviets facing the party house, indeed uh, dwarfing it, um, and closing also the Largo from the uh, western uh, side. Uh, the architectural projects for all these buildings were assigned to the centralized architectural bureaus with a very tight schedule. And uh, I will look more closely into the institutional dynamics of uh, the planning job that uh, followed to discuss also the third aspect of Largo's failure, uh, that of the reorganization of the technical cadres. Uh, but uh, let me first zoom uh, into the construction site of uh, Largo itself. Now, it is a common understanding in Bulgaria, and it's often repeated as a fact by historians who do not deal with uh, urban history, that the huge demolitions uh, inflicted by the Allied uh, air raids in uh, 1943 and 44 uh, opened up this large central area uh, for new construction. 
So while this sounds plausible and much of the area was indeed bombarded and uh, raised uh, during the war, uh, it's not uh, completely accurate. Um, confidential governmental decrees on the construction of Lago that I found uh, in the archives during my um, research uh, include uh, lists of uh, existing buildings that had to be demolished for this massive uh, project. And interestingly, quite a few buildings severely damaged by bombs had already been restored and almost immediately destined to be uh, demolished again for the uh, ensemble. Uh, the initial list uh, included 27 multi-story buildings in total, and this is not counting uh, various uh, single-family houses and uh, ramshackle structures and so on. Uh, the larger buildings uh, were from the interwar period, and since then uh, the area was a busy and relatively upscale commercial zone. Uh, these were mainly ferro concrete constructions, often with uh, elevators and other uh, amenities. Uh, while most were uh, still damaged, three had been repaired and uh, five were even uh, newly built in this demolition list. So altogether around 4,000 square meters of built space uh, was uh, sacrificed to clear up the construction site. Much of it was for commercial and business purposes, but yet 113 families, these are more than 400 persons, uh, were displaced in the process. And just to put this in a broader perspective, um, this is at a time when the population of Sofia had increased over 50% uh, in the five years uh, following the war, and housing construction lacked uh, so much behind that newly built uh, units uh, could accommodate no, uh, no more than 10% of uh, the newcomers. And this is already disregarding the dire needs of the uh, locals, uh, many among them uh, having closed their homes uh, during the war. So all this adds uh, more weight to my argument that Lago represented a failure of the post-war reconstruction in the sense that uh, it betrayed uh, its incentives and uh, declared mission. Uh, but let's now uh, look into the planning and construction, and uh, especially into the very cumbersome bureaucratic process inside the recently centralized architectural bodies. That is, once private practice was abolished, uh, the professional societies were disbanded, and architectural work was uh, largely confined to the um, bureaus inside the state uh, administration. Supervision of all these bureaus, uh, no matter if with uh, municipal or sectoral affiliation, was concentrated uh, in the architecture directorate at the Ministry of Co Communal Economy uh, and Public Works uh, as of uh, 1950 when this uh, directorate was uh, created. So the planning assignment of um, WARGU, uh, which was commissioned just a year later, uh, and uh, which would uh, eventually uh, engage unprecedented number of professionals, 185 people, uh, became kind of a test case for this uh, newly devised system of management over uh, urban planning and public architecture. And as I will argue, uh, this uh, new system uh, failed. Not only centralized oversight uh, failed to optimize management and to coordinate all professional units involved, but it created a lot of tensions among them, frictions or even conflicts uh, ran both vertically along the chain of uh, command and horizontally uh, between architectural teams that were presumably in partnerships, but also between the planning and construction agencies. At the bottom of this tension was the clash between technical rationality and uh, political expediencies. On, on the one hand, uh, it was due to the constant interference by political functionaries, but on the other hand, uh, there was a profound problem of uh, temporalizing, um, as I call it, the, the work process. And this is something that is uh, already evident in the lengthy cycle of planning over the previous five years that I briefly um, touched upon. So planning was either blocked in a protracted series of competitions, each ending with some ref formulation of the assignment uh, and the new call uh, instead of selecting actually a winning uh, project and moving forward. 
Our planning uh, was accelerated to a Stahanovite uh, tempo of drafting projects uh, overnight and then putting them into execution literally on the next morning, which was very much uh, the case with the mausoleum, but uh, was also to some extent the case with the, the party house, which went ahead of planning. And this double speed of um, standby or rushing uh, headlong um, normally uh, and obviously contradicted uh, any idea of uh, technical uh, process. So I argue that this failure uh, was not a random setback, but it was uh, a systemic problem which would uh, inevitably pervade uh, the planning process as long as it was organized in this uh, top-down and uh, bureaucratically supervised uh, way, and as long um, as expertise was subordinate to uh, political decisions. Uh, as I said already, uh, the entire schedule for the design of Wargo and 9th of September Square was uh, pretty tight. So in November uh, 1951 came out the governmental decree uh, commissioning the job uh, and all plans had to be completed and approved in exactly a year. And then in two more years, by the end of the 1954, uh, everything had to be built. So finished, uh, inaugurated, and so on. Yet this schedule would be uh, infused with delays, and the first one occurred uh, on the political top, uh, though of course responsibility would later be shifted down the, the line to the technical leadership. And this delay was caused by the Council of Ministers, uh, which had to approve the preliminary documentation for all the buildings. That's basically the detailed assignment with uh, all locational, technical, and financial uh, parameters before the actual plans would uh, s uh, start being drafted. Uh, for some unknown reasons, the Council of Ministers stalled for several months, and at this point the architecture directorate violated the law and set up teams to start designing the buildings uh, as they were running out of time for the individual projects. Uh, while the buildings were already on the drawing board, um, the, the leveling plan for the entire area of the two squares uh, hit a wall. As I told you already, uh, the leveling was a problem already before the new buildings have started popping up. Several ministries and other state agencies could not agree on this uh, leveling plan, so a special governmental commission was established to deal with this. And that happened three and a half months before the deadline for the architectural projects. So no matter that the entire terrain and the individual plots were under deliberation, including the demolition list that uh, I've mentioned earlier, architects were doing their jobs uh, while being kept in the dark uh, regarding crucial parameters. Then another source of uh, delays and abstractions uh, were the investors. And uh, this begs for a brief um, explanation of this role in the context of um, the planned economy. Investors were uh, assigned this role just like planners, uh, so they enjoyed neither initiative uh, nor much choice over the whole enterprise under their investment. They couldn't turn it down, uh, but they could stall in order to spare resources, and I mean mainly technical resources, not, not so much financial. So they're basically expert capacity, which uh, they needed for the tasks that were uh, part of their own annual plans. Uh, in this case, investors were three ministries of uh, electrification, heavy industry, and domestic trade. Uh, the Council of Ministers was also an investor, and two more agencies. You can see the buildings and relate them to the separate um, institutions that uh, were in charge. That's the preliminary uh, plan. The other, uh, st uh, the, the other state agencies were the Committee of uh, Culture for the Opera and Sofia Municipality for the uh, Hotel. And uh, what uh, you can see in terms of coloring here, uh, the dark uh, black is what eventually was built, uh, at the, which had already been under construction at the time. Uh, those kind of uh, semi, um, like, uh, the two ministries are the things that are under construction, and uh, this kind of lightest um, entities were those that uh, would not be finished eventually, it would never be planned. So all of these investors um, dragged their feet and when uh, asked to send their own experts into the teams, uh, did not even uh, bother to respond. 
Uh, and by the way, this was uh, such a typical problem for planners that the major planning organizations uh, counted uh, man hours wasted in futile uh, dealings with investors in their annual uh, reports. Uh, but uh, while planners suffered from the indifference of investors, uh, they showed uh, the same attitude towards the construction companies uh, once they had uh, uh, completed and submitted their projects. In a work process that was artificially fragmented among a number of sub-branches uh, in the centralized administration, every uh, organization cared only for its own task and not for the overall job. So uh, after all, they reported plan fulfillment. That was kind of a fundamental indicator for economic performance uh, under socialism. Uh, they, uh, so they reported for their plan fulfillment. Um, for their own assignments, uh, no matter that they were integral part of a larger process, and no matter if this process would move forward or would get blocked. So architects uh, rarely even visited the construction site, uh, let alone supervise uh, consistently the implementation of their projects. In this way, um, technical errors were made uh, and left unnoticed, or when they were identified, it was with much delay making construction both uh, longer and more uh, expensive. So the entire uh, process of planning and constructing LAG was infused with broken coordination and with conflicts among uh, cooperating organizations, uh, regular interference, and at the same time uh, neglect by the supervising political organs. The result was that uh, the entire 9th of September square, with the three adjacent uh, buildings, uh, simply fell out of the construction program. Uh, at first, uh, the work on it uh, fell behind, uh, that on Wargu, and uh, then it gradually got uh, block, blocked. Uh, the previously noted problems uh, with the terrain remained uh, unresolved, and it never was uh, developed further. Another item that disappeared uh, from the agenda was the House of uh, Soviets, and probably this, you find this design quite uh, familiar now after the talks of uh, Michal and uh, Irina. It, of course, reproduces this uh, Soviet uh, model of Lomonosov University. And it was supposed to be the main volume in the whole ensemble. Uh, most likely, uh, it fell out because of the exuberant costs exactly for this uh, building. Uh, even what was eventually built was delayed, and because of political circumstances, it was faithfully delayed. Largo was uh, inaugurated uh, in 1957, shortly after Khrushchev's uh, secret speech uh, set destalinization in motion, and uh, two years after the All Union Congress on Construction and Architecture in Moscow, uh, which condemned loud and clear the ex excesses of Stalinist monumentalism as an abuse of economic and labor resources. So even before it was completed, Largo was stigmatized already as an example of, I quote a later excerpt, but um, it was already in the mid-50s that that was the, the spirit. Uh, the architectural forms of the slave-owning society and feudalism that with their monumentality of stone and their coldness were in over discrepancy with the vitality uh, of the socialist system with its deep uh, humanism. This is an editorial uh, of uh, Architectura Journal from 1962. Uh, Luben Tonev, author of the master plan himself, uh, uh, hailed the failure uh, to plan and build the House of Soviets, post factum, like in... Uh, and he held it as one, uh, as the one great success, quote, of this whole ambitious enterprise. Uh, in fact, uh, from the 1960s onwards, the Bulgarian Communist Party wished to move its headquarters elsewhere and several times commissioned plans for a new structure, though without much uh, publicity. And ironically, these plans were sidelined by other priorities of political expediency, and the party remained in its uh, Stalinist uh, tower. Still, it is important to note that the party congresses, which took uh, place every four or five years, moved out of the party house and its uh, congress hall, which was uh, especially designed for the purpose of, uh, for, of these party congresses. Uh, and, that, um, uh, and those were staged only twice there in 58 and uh, 62, uh, whereas the next three in the 60s and 70s were hosted in Universiade, the symbol of uh, Bulgaria's uh, return to modernism after destalinization. 
And then the last two prior to uh, 1999 uh, were hosted exactly here in the National Palace of uh, Culture, which was the flagship of uh, Sophie's architecture in the 80s. Actually, the last party congress in 1990, which was extraordinary outside of the, the regular um, schedule, was also housed here. And this was the last party congress because the party committed to um, to reform, even if in name only, and became socialist instead of uh, communist at this Congress. And just to end, um, I'll make a big a leap in time uh, to Largo post-1989 um, to argue that uh, today it symbolically epitomizes the failure of transition. Uh, after the ruby red uh, star on top of the party house was uh, removed by helicopter in the autumn of 1990, uh, which was a very highly publicized uh, operation, and you could probably find footage in YouTube and all that. Uh, but the building itself, uh, the building of the party house, uh, soon became a seat of the uh, parliament of democratic uh, Bulgaria. Uh, and in this case, uh, contrary to uh, Michal's uh, thesis about the Palace of uh, Culture and Science, uh, ownership uh, changed, uh, but uh, not that much, uh, and the use certainly did not change. And in that sense, probably the building was not decolonialized. Um, and that's how this uh, gargantuan structure, uh, designed literally like an ivory tower of power according to very Stalinist principles, uh, had to facilitate uh, very different uh, relationships uh, between civil ser servants and citizens instead of uh, rulers and ruled uh, as it was intended to do. And it was only recently uh, that the new government, the current government, decided to move back uh, to the historic parliamentary building. Um, and that was indeed a symbolically loaded gesture meant to pass uh, judgment on the post-communist political regime, uh, which had uh, reclaimed the party house. And with that very current image that I've made a few weeks ago, maybe I'll um, end my presentation. Thank you for your attention.